absolute Batman, the absolute unit, the Batman who lifts, whatever you're calling him, it's time. We've also seen Brickman tossed in there because of certain renditions of the logo. There has been a lot of discussion in the lead up to the, at the time of recording, new Batman book, Absolute Batman number one, taking place in the absolute universe, which is a separate universe from the main DC universe. Cliff Note's way to think about it is an ultimate style universe, but for DC. There's been lots of chatter about this one specifically. It's also time of recording had the biggest lead up. There's been a lot of things you may have seen about the logo, the look, the bat axe. Well, now it's here and we can discuss it in full detail. And that means spoilers. We're all in on spoilers in this video. So you've been warned. I'm Sasha. This is Casually Comics. And let's discuss Absolute Batman. Absolute Batman number one was written by Scott Snyder with art by Nick Dragota with colors by Frank Martin. Maybe look, the letter's name is Clayton Cowles. The core concept behind the absolute universe is that the characters will have different struggles because the world has been shifted around them, meaning they themselves have different starting positions. This is a world that is meant to be powered by dark side energy. That doesn't really come up in this first issue of Absolute Batman though. There are some big changes that this means for Bruce, but one of the ones that was out there beforehand and one of the more obvious shifts is his positioning within society. This Bruce Wayne was not born rich. Instead, he's closer to middle class or lower middle class. This starts him off right away from a different vantage point on his journey to becoming Batman. It gives him different strengths and weaknesses because there are advantages and disadvantages to it. This also has a different energy than what tends to happen sometimes in the main universe, which is taking Bruce's wealth away from him. In this universe, he never had it. Although they briefly address the concept, but it's more subtle and thematic. This Bruce is meant to be separate from the mainline Batman. However, comparisons are inevitable because since he is a different version, it is that that he is being measured against. However, this story does go out of its way to try and situate and establish this Bruce's situation and make him really fleshed out as his own character. It does set out to differentiate and update things, and it starts that off right away with bats. It plays with the whole a bat flew through my window thing. In the original Batman tales, all the way back in the golden age, this when his origin was first detailed, his costume was inspired by the fact that a bat flew through his window. And over the years, there have been various levels of dramatics depending upon the interpretation. In this story, he's always liked bats. He's always had a fascination with them. In fact, they were the foundation of an invention that he made, which won his class a trip to the zoo, which is also the title of this first story arc. And it's also a bit of an overarching theme for how you can look at Gotham as a kind kind of human zoo. It's something that starts off a bit more in the background, but will most likely become more foregrounded as the story goes on. But there are things like how Black Mask's gang are wearing ape masks. Black Mask, who is the main antagonist, his followers are also referred to as animals. Their gang is called the party animals. It's sardonic. Now in this setting, Bruce's father is a school teacher on the trip. And this is a fictional story. So, you know, that can only lead to disaster. There's a lot of foreshadowing going on through various means from the very beginning. There'll be plenty of time for bats later. Like your whole life, son, after I'm dead. <laughs> There's also the use of a gun on the splash page. It is a very striking image, and it's also an indicator that Bruce is still gonna have some issues with them in this universe. The story here is intercut with Bruce's past. It builds. And so we also get to see his story alongside the story of Gotham and some of the other characters within. From the past, we go to the city's present, and we see that Bruce is not the narrator, but rather it's Alfred, who was returned to Gotham, which is a city that's on the decline. There is clear inspiration inspiration taken from The Dark Knight Returns in terms of the feel and aesthetic of Gotham, as well as the decay that's going on within, particularly with the talking heads, the news stations, those kind of things, but it's not overdone. And because Nick Dragota's art style is so different, it transforms the style in a way. And also because of the advanced tech, it gives it a bit of a Batman Beyond vibe at points. At times, there's some neo-Gotham energy, depending upon the panel. Not quite that advanced, but shades of. Alfred here is in his more grizzled MI6 mode. Mode. So you're more kicking butt, Alfred. He's also got this whole thing going on with Gotham, this, this city. My third lap around and I still can't find it. Where's your heart? You used to have a center, hot and beating, but something's hollowed you out. My name is Alfred Pennyworth and I'm here to do some bad things. Alfred's rocking those Ra's al Ghul side streaks. That means he means business. In this issue, he's been sent to investigate a crime spike because Gotham's not doing well. You know what it needs? A Batman. <laughs> it's also shown that he's got some issues with his daughter, Julia. Julia Pennyworth sighting. She keeps making it through all these updates. 
a Julia sighting always makes me tense up and wonder if we're going to go Bronze Age with it. In the Bronze Age, Alfred was trying really hard to set Julia up with Bruce. Speaking of Bruce, after we're introduced to Alfred, we get to see a better look at a grown-up Bruce. And he's huge. This Bruce Wayne grew up in the Narrows, aka Crime Alley. This Bruce is also a contemporary of some familiar characters. For example, the gym is called Crocs, and it's run by Waylon Jones who in the main universe fans may know as Killer Croc. There are a few things to unpack here. One is that we see that he's using his training to work through his anger about what happened in his past. But we also get to see some philosophy that's been instilled with him about the systems of Gotham and how they work. Um, that this guy has the life? Enlighten us, Bruce. Well, it says here he sleeps 20 hours, plus he gets fed prime rib three times a day and never has to be afraid of anything. Fair, he might be coddled, but he'll never affect anything never mean very much. He never has to go to school. Now, this may rankle some because if you read through this scene and take the lion potentially as a manifestation of the upper echelon of society and then potentially then apply that to Batman because that is the position that some place him in in certain narratives, then it could be read as that this is a critique on the concept that someone benefiting from wealth and comfort could enact any real change. Something that can be argued against through many historical story examples with Batman, but it is a sentiment held by some in regards to the character and is something that this version of Batman is going to do a bit differently because he embodies a different station inside of the system. There's been a lot of talk about that in the lead up to this, about breaking systems from within but from the bottom. The idea that it's more meaningful or more possible or something that someone would want to do more from the bottom than from the top. This is one of those moments that's meant to define and ground this version of Bruce, especially because it's discussion happening before tragedy is about to strike. But some may take a front on the original Bruce's behalf. Miles will vary. I'm sure you'll let me know how you feel down below. Bruce, knowing a lot of characters who fans who are familiar with the lore will recognize as villains for him in the mainline universe is also someone that could land a variety of ways. For some, will increase the stakes and chances of drama. Bruce and Croc are friends, and it's made mention that he's also friends with Edward Nigma, Oswald Cobblepot, and Selina. They're at nickname level, too. They're calling each other Ozzy and Eddie and the like. We see a childhood photo, so we know the connection runs deep. Whalen even makes a comment about how Bruce isn't hanging out with them as much as he used to. So they're aware that he's pulling away. And we also learn a bit about some of the things the others are doing. Some of them are already slipping into a life of crime and some are just careening towards it like Ozzy. So like mainline Batman, we see that this Bruce is also having to sacrifice his personal life in pursuit of his goal. But in this world, we see he has more connections to sacrifice right off the bat. For some, this may be compelling. For others, it may feel fanficy. It's giving everybody went to the same high school. This issue is very much having fun with being a comic story. So it does things like have Waylon have a pet crocodile. Sometimes the story's logic runs in the vein of you can imagine kids playing on a playground. Oh, you have my Batman surrounded? Well, I take off his logo and it becomes an ax. A battle axe. Many of these things are walking a fine line between edge and cool. And for some, it's going to tip more one way than the other. This issue is very much building up to the reveal of Batman. So we get to see Black Mask first and establish him as a bit of a menace. We get to see his death masks that he keeps and his 2000 AD Judge Dreddy style vibe. Our first sighting of Batman gets to be when the party animals go and attack a conference that's being hosted by Mayor Gordon. And there we finally get to see Batman. Barbara sees him first and then Alfred and then we get to see his description of Bruce and his techniques and how he fights and basically narrating this first encounter. And the action sequence where you get to see Batman fully unleashed, in my opinion, it's cool. The colors on the shot where he's jumping down into the gunfire, poster material. And these pages were shown fairly early, but you get to see his costume in action and how the various aspects have been more inspired by bats, even more so than usual. The hooks on his cape mimicking how they grab onto things and he can walk on them. His costume is also more multi-purpose, like his ears come off and he can throw them as knives. And this Batman, when you fight him, you quite clearly get hurt. Not that that doesn't happen with the original Batman, but it's just a bit more visceral in this opening fight because people are getting stabbed. But it's noted quite importantly by Alfred that they don't get killed, that this Batman is idealistic, as he puts it, because he's trying not to grievously wound anybody. This is in keeping with Batman wanting to strike fear, but 
also, more importantly, inspire some kind of change. Ultimately, Batman is looking to help. It's not just about vengeance. It's more so about justice, and not just for him, but for Gotham. And so that core element of Batman is still very much present. He does, however, chop off a man's hand with an axe. The axe is one of those suspending moments for people. For some, it's silly. It'd be cumbersome. How would he move? That's so much weight and just, mm -mm. For others, super cool, aggressive MacGyver shenanigans. It transforms. This does veer a bit into edgy territory. We also have a Grawlix. The rest of you, I'm going to give you one chance to get the f*** out of my way. If there was ever a Batman who needed the Christian Bale Bat voice, it's this one. All this is in keeping with the energy of this issue, the tone. It's got a very clear sense of identity as to what it is. So it's the kind of thing where if one is enjoying it or not enjoying it, it's going to be fairly clear early on, which is the case. After the showdown, the rest of the issue is dedicated to Alfred learning about Batman. Who is he? Which he finds out very quickly which is concerning for Bruce, or it should be. This allows him to impart the knowledge that he's learned onto the audience without it feeling too much like an exposition dump, or at least one that feels inorganic. It makes sense that he would be saying this or recording it. He's keeping notes. So he learns that Batman is Bruce Wayne. What? That he's 24. He's a genius who won an engineering competition in the fifth grade because he was inspired by the Batwing, which led into the incident. And here we get to see another key difference in that only one of Bruce's parents died. It was his father. And we get to see some of the details, but not all of them. After that, you lose yourself for a while, lash out, rage at the world, but then you find yourself again. Something inspires you. Bats, they hang upside down. Some may find the whole bats and they walk on their hands and they're upside down thing a tiny bit cheesy, but it is very in keeping with the original core of how Batman was inspired in a way that's sweet. And it's really fascinating to see that same energy brought forward. Also, yes, the whole he lashed out was bad for a bit, more Terry vibes. But we also see that Bruce turned his life around and this is when he goes through the whole he trained and he also had to position himself to learn about the way the city worked socially, politically. So he still had to move in those worlds, but he had to do it as an intern the like and from another position. It's the reverse of how mainline Bruce has to say, go undercover as matches. Maybe this Bruce will have to create an upper crust persona. Ooh, what will he name him? A Chaz Bondsworth, I don't know. The point is he has to learn literally and figuratively about Gotham structures. And he also gets a job as a city engineer and this will allow him to be able to move through the city and set up his bases. He also clearly still has some assets because to be able to do all the things he's done, you need some form of wealth. Even if he got some scholarships and the like, you do still have to do some suspending for the time frame of all this. That's part of the Batman experience. Now, Bruce having a parent who is still alive does give him another thing that he's attached to. So this Batman has connections that he has pre-existing. The potential for Mama's Boy Bruce could be really sweet. We'll see how it plays out. There's more to these ape skull masks than first appears. Ah yes, they've returned to Monkey. The main part of the issue ends with Batman and Alfred showing down, facing off, because Alfred tracks him down to where he's been roaming across the rooftops he knows are unoccupied. I guess Alfred's gonna have to teach him to be more slick because he found him pretty quickly. We do have a moment here that may prove contentious for some. We get one of those <gasps> Legasp panels Batman with a gun. He also shoots Alfred in the head with it, but action movie logic, he's fine because Bruce modified it to be non-lethal. And by fictional rules, that means you can shoot anybody from any range. He was just edging being the Batman who kills. That's for other universes. The little batarangs in Alfred's face made me chuckle. This Batman has a bit more of an obvious sense of humor. He's a little sassy. We end on this gorgeous shot of Batman riding the motorcycle he stole from Alfred against an enormous, we should be concerned about the size of it moon. But there's also a little epilogue that has another fairly big change inside of it, which is one that some of you guessed, but the Joker in this universe, not only does he not laugh and he's very dour, but he's also rich. There is a lot you could do with a Joker who was always rich. Not a joker who's come into money or stolen it, but has always had it. Now for some, this may be a bit too on the nose because the way this is working with systems and positioning wealth is automatically negative. But then having the joker be a product of that may seem like a logical conclusion. Well, for others, regardless of whether they think that or not, it may provide a unique dynamic for this joker and this Bruce. It changes the relationship between them, between the joker and Batman, between the joker and the other villains. It could be made to be a commentary on the enablement of negative behavior through privilege 
privilege and station, a joker who's protected because of his class. It's a flip that could potentially be a fresh take on this age-old rivalry. For Absolute Batman number one, there are some very fun ideas here. And like with anything, it's going to come down to execution. But in this story's case, all of the readers are down to accept this version. This issue has many strengths. It has a strong, arresting, kinetic art style. Some of the panels are absolutely gorgeous. The story is tight, has its own sense of internal logic that it adheres to. It has clear direction and an underlying theme in where it's going. It also has some clever nods to the original past lore. It's trying to strike a balance with Bruce, with him being both underdog power fantasy and groundedly human through his tragedy and connections. It does have an I'm going for it kind of energy. And that's not just because that's something that's been discussed in many interviews. You can see it in some of the creative choices that have been made. And that will resonate with some and not with others. For me, it was a really fun ride and I'm very curious to see where it's going. How Bruce's friendships are going to impact him being Batman. How tweaks in his social positioning are going to play out. Just more of these cool fights and art. However, this will not be for everyone. There is an edge here, and for some, the fact that this is happening in its own separate contained universe will not negate the fact that that's something they don't enjoy. Some simply don't like an edgy, violent Batman. It's too much of a grim, dark, dark night. Some may feel that it's an insult to the original concept of Batman, that there's nothing wrong with Batman's position as it is, and they don't want to see that tweaked, that if there's so many changes to be made, just make a new character or make somebody else Batman, not Bruce. Or maybe some may feel it was a missed opportunity to not have it be someone who wasn't Bruce, or may have too many undertones of other things they've already seen, like The Dark Knight Returns or Batman Beyond, as mentioned. For some, it may be as simple as things like they don't like the logo or the look, or just that classic, not my Batman. One thing is for sure, it's likely to elicit a response. And I want to hear what yours was. I want to hear what you think. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Was it fun for you? Was it trying too hard? Do you think it was cool? Are you on the not my Batman train? Terry McThickness, I want to hear it all. I'm having a blast discussing it, so please share all your thoughts down below. And while you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking some time to spend discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.